Hi everyone, welcome to the Basics of Beekeeping by the Jenny Bee Project. My name is Jenny Bee um, and I'm going to be going through today the, uh, the basics of beekeeping. I have this class in both a, um, you know, a couple hour course, just a quick kind of cr crash course, as well as like, a breakdown into five different sessions, um, which is a little bit more involved for each subject. So here I'm going to just uh, go through my, my crash course, which sometimes I do um, locally at the community centers, libraries, um, free seminars, things like that, but we're going to get things online. Um, so yeah, we're going to work today uh, with this uh, class here. So today's goals will be um, a basic outline of beekeeping in the northeast of the U.S. Um, so I just bring this up because there's different areas, you know, in the country, in the world that beekeeping takes on a different form. So um, it's important to know that when you're getting information about beekeeping, it's near your area where you're keeping bees. Um, even the weather can be different an hour or two, you know, differently from you, your altitude, snow, beach, salt water, plant life. Um, so all of those things will have... Um, a you know bearing on how you keep your bees and the decisions that you make um, so luckily the biology whoops, of the bees is the same everywhere so if you can understand that and kind of pick up those concepts you'll be able to make decisions about beekeeping how it works for you because those are kind of universal truths but um, just know that when you're looking at videos or education things like that just be a little bit weary of where um, the videos the education is taking place that you make sure that it pertains to what you're doing um, so we're going to go through the tools, uh, hive components, honeybee lifespan, bee-centric beekeeping, um, practices, good neighbor policy. So just to give you a quick overview of this, um, you know, the basics, tools, hive components, that's going to be about beekeeping, literally physical tools and stuff. Um, we're going to go through the lifespan of the honeybee because that's going to be part of the biology that you'll use when you're making the decisions um, about how to, you know, keep your bees, basically. Uh, Bee-centric bee beekeeping um, is really based on making sure that the bees come first. So this should always be how you keep your bees. Uh, you know, we all want honey and fun things like that, and, and pollination is great. You know, all the reasons that bees are, are amazing creatures, but we need to make sure that everything that we're doing, they come first before our needs. So if you don't have enough, you know, honey, nectar, whatever, um, in the hive to make sure that they're going to be okay and they're going to get through the winter, don't be taking, you know, their resources from, from them if they're not going to survive. Um, and we'll get into that in each subject, you know, how to be bee-centric about it. Um, there's different ways you can do it. There's different treatments. So you do find what's right for you, but they always have to come first. That's just like how I teach, uh, how it should be. Um, don't be robbing. You're only going to pay for it in the end if you try to take advantage of them anyway. Um, you'll lose money. You'll lose resources yourself, and it's just not, not the right way to be. Um, and then the good neighbor policy, which is something that um, – we pick up from actually the Long Island Beekeeping Club. So it's just something I'll, I'll touch on, but it's a great kind of, you know, step by step, just like what you should do if you know you want to be a good neighbor to people that are next door to you. Uh, just things to look out for where you're going to place your hive, you know, things um, that, that won't bother them. You can have the education behind it so that if they have any questions, you'll know how to answer things correctly. So we'll go through that a little bit at the end. Um, and then also like where to maintain, obtain, sorry, next steps for, for the beginner beekeeper. So joining clubs, things like that. So I'll have some information on that and, um, you know, how to help other pollinators, insects, um, vital to the environment. You know, keeping bees is one of many ways we can help pollinators. Um, there's so many out there. So some, sometimes people at the end of this class decide it's too much for them. Um, that's okay. It's, that's kind of the point of this class is to see if this is for you. Uh, people sometimes feel like, they're looking for something to just like put a hive in the backyard, let it be, and that's it. I think beekeeping many years ago may have been like this, but not so much anymore. So uh, there's there's a little bit more to deal with. We have mites, we have pests, we have you know things we have to treat for um, and watch out for a little bit more than say 50, 80 years ago. Um, it's changed a little bit. So uh, yeah, so if that's if, so if it's not for you, that's okay. And there's other things like mason beehives, bug hotels, um, planting that you can do to help uh, pollinators in the environment. So we'll, we'll you know touch on that in the end as well. So bees are super vital to the environment for so many reasons. Bees pollinate 80% of the flowering plants on earth. Um, one single bee colony can pollinate 300 million flowers each day. That's insane. Um, seeds, fruits, berries eaten by birds, small animals are from plants that are pollinated by bees. Um, so, you know, this is kind of just one of the reasons we love, we love bees and, and even wild bees. We have to, you know, be sure that we're thinking about all different bee species, um, not just honeybees. So they're, you know, pollinators are super, super important to our food chain. 
Um, in fact, at the, the bottom here, it says if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe when man would only have four years left to live. Um, so that's by Albert Einstein. So he, you know, kind of did the math on this. And uh, I don't know how true that is exactly. I've heard kind of this um, broken down a little bit. But yeah, there's, um, you know, things we really have to take into consideration when taking care of our pollinators because this is, you know, our food source here. So I'd just like to touch on this a little bit. Um, so bees are in decline. We've been hearing that for many years now, if you've been kind of following the news and, and more people getting interested in keeping bees. So colony collapse disorder, CCD, is what you're going to hear about a lot. So there's actually like a technical definition for colony collapse disorder, which is um, it's a little bit tricky because it, technically it's when you know, your your bees abscond the hive and the queen is left with just a few worker bees. Um, it doesn't mean that your hive has just died or the whole thing is just emptied out and absconded. Like there's a very specific set of circumstances that are for colony collapse. Um, but that being said, you know, there's a lot of reasons that hives just don't make it. Um, so we kind of touch on those here in this little pamphlet that I give out. Uh, it's not, say, you know, you have a loss um, over winter. There's there's a lot of different reasons that could be. Maybe you didn't feed them enough. Maybe you didn't leave them enough uh, uh, food. Maybe, you know, there was, you know, poison next door that they, you know, um, treated treated their lawns with some chemicals, something like that. So that's like a bee poisoning. So there's a lot of different reasons your colonies could go, but is it technically colony collapse disorder? Maybe not. So that's kind of why I bring this up. Um, so I'll just go through this quick because this is something really important to understand. Uh, these things all have to do with each other. So pesticides, for example, are just one part we've all been hearing about. Um, they can kill insects. Um, there's there's a variety called ne uh, neon nicotinoids, if you can say that, um, that are particularly harmful to bee populations. This is a little bit tricky because some of these um, this classification, it could be better than other things that were out there before. So this is a little bit controversial, but pesticides in general um, that are, you know, inherently in the things that we're growing in our lawns and our foods and things like that, they're not good for bees, animals, any of us. Um, but we do have to weigh the pros and cons of certain treatments. So this is something, you know, I delve into a little bit in um, a pesticide paper that I wrote, but it, this is a little bit tricky, but something to keep in mind. Um, Let's see, loss of habitat is a big one because, you know, we are developing lands all the time, um, you know, knocking down forests and this and deforestation and, and overdeveloping, overcleaning our lawns and trying to get that perfect golf course lawn and, you know, so on. So the more natural we can keep things, uh, it's it's really, you know, it might look messy, but it's really good for, for habitats for a lot of not just bees, but um, a lot of wild, you know, insects, animals, things like that, that they need, they need habitat. Um, you know, they, they need that old wood and that stacked up brush pile in the corner of your lawn. That's, that's habitat for them. So don't be too quick to, um, you know, clean up. <laughs> so climate change is a big one. We will notice this um, year after year, especially in New York, we see a lot of climate change in the fall, I'd say. Maybe the spring and the fall is like our big, you know, when we really notice this, for example, it just snowed two days ago and then it was 70 degrees the next day. This happens in the spring and, and the fall time. So we really have to be careful of how we are treating our bees. And again, that bee centric, do they have enough, you know, resources, this, that for emergency odd weather like that. So as an example, if we have a really warm fall, which we've had a lot of last few years, um, Sometimes you're taking your last honey flow, honey extraction, you know, September, October, whatever it may be, like you're done for the season in the Hudson Valley, we get a little bit of a late honey flow again, but you want to make sure that they have enough honey because if you get a warm, you know, October, November, December, these bees could be using all of those stores of of honey that you have left for them thinking that you've left enough and then January, February, you know, that last tail end before spring comes, you're losing your bees because um, the weather was warm, they were active, they weren't kind of in a diapause, you know, slash hibernation period. So they've used all their, their honey stores. So there's things that we can do to prepare for that, but this is what we have to kind of be aware of with this climate change. Um, and then pathogens. So mites are a really big deal. Mites are one of the biggest killers of colonies. So there's several ways to treat for mites and test for mites. Um, but we should really just all be treating for mites in one way or another. It's, um, it's very important. There's a lot of ways to do it. Organic treatments, chemical treatments, mechanical treatments. Um, you know, I'll go into it a little bit here, but we have another class that's like developed just for going into every single treatment. Um, so, uh, so some of these things though can affect the other. So pesticides might weaken 
bees themselves, then they cannot fight off pathogens. Climate change, um, if they don't have enough food and they're not healthy and, and so on, then they can't fight off pathogens. If they don't have a place habitat, they don't have enough food. Like, so all these things kind of relate. So this is why these four things are what you really see come up a lot um, in terms of, of keeping bees and how we can uh, better, you know, think about not just honeybees, but why, you know, wild bees, animals, everything. This really all relates. And you'll start to notice if you keep bees or animals, you know, um, wild animals, whatever you want to call it, you know, farm animals, this and that, you'll really start to notice the world around you and, um, you know, weather, wind, rain, moisture content, it's all going to become a lot more um, prevalent in your mind. So anyways, moving on. So superorganisms, the colony and swarming. So I always mention first that the, um, the bees cannot survive alone. They are not solitary bees, um, honeybees that is. They are a superorganism. So a superorganism is an organism consisting of many organisms. Um, they can only really exist with each other. They can't, you know, the worker bee can't exist on its own. They need a queen bee, they need drones. Um, they have a highly organized division of labor. So they have to exist together as a super Super organism. So other bees, um, some wild bees, mason bees, things like that will just be solitary bees, but these uh, honeybees will exist as a super organism colony, um, which is kind of cool because you know what, we are in the quarantine right now and some of why we're getting more of this stuff online, but we really realize how much even our own society, we are a super organism, we exist with each other, you know, most of us and we'll rely on each other in a way. So it's, it's been really interesting to kind of watch things unfold here um, and compare it to the colony of a bee, beehive. So, uh, so I'm going to just go through the basic um, three bees that live in the colony. We have our queen bee everybody knows about. So right here, I'm just going to point. So queen bees are very long, um, long abdomen. You know, you can kind of spot her a little bit quickly she, when she's walking through the hive. Um, you're going to notice like the bees kind of toward, you know, uh, turn toward her. They kind of make a little path. They let her through. Um, so she's a little bit hard to find sometimes, but easier, you know, than the other bees, which we might uh, confuse a little bit. So the queen bee, there is just one. Her job is to just lay eggs and she presides over the hive. Um, even her pheromones, her personality will kind of, you know, determine the personality of the hive, which is kind of cool. Um, so she'll live for several years, um, unlike these other two bees here. So the worker bees are the female bees um, that collect food, water, they care for the larva. They're security guard bees. They have all different um, jobs that we'll get into real quick, but they change over their lifespan, um, what jobs they have. And then the drone bees are the male bees over here. Sometimes you will see drones that are big and fat and you're going to think they're the queen and they're not necessarily, but um, yeah, so these are the drones over here. Uh, they will oh, they will look different. So different species of bees, and um, we'll, we'll mention that in a minute, but they might have different coloring a little bit. Maybe the queen is dark. Maybe she's lighter gold. You know, there's just different species. A lot of the bees out there are mutts at this point, <laughs> just like our dogs. You know, they're, they're interbreeding with each other. So maybe you have Russians, Italians, all different species out there that are, um, you know, intermingling and, and breeding. So you're going to see all different colors. So they don't necessarily all have the same, you know, striping and so on. Um, whoopsies. But the drones here are the males in the hive and they, um, they do not have stingers. Their job is to mate with the queen bee. Um, when it is the right time of year, um, sometime in spring. The so drones usually, you know, there's drone brood, we'll get into that, but they will meet the queens um, that are not mated yet in a congregation area. And um, it's basically kind of just like, I like to compare it to going out at night um, to the bar. It's like they're like mating area, like they all meet. And it's there's some research showing that there are similar places every season that these guys go. Um, you know, it's a little bit more advanced, but it's just good to know that they kind of meet in this, this area in the spring. They mate with the new queens that that have hatched um, and then the queen basically just for a couple days leaves the hive uh, mates with these drones and then that is the eggs that she has for the rest of her life she only leaves for those couple of days um, in the beginning of her life she goes on these mating flights they call them and uh, from there she just has all those eggs forever and that's what she lays until you decide to either requeen or they decide to requeen the hive themselves um, or you can just you know let her kind of you know die out depends there's a few ways to go about that so like I mentioned a couple seconds ago, um, the worker bee has different jobs over the lifespan here. So just um, lifespan wise, it's really interesting because in peak season, the bees might only live say five, six weeks uh, when they're working really hard and they're out there all the time. 
and then in the winter they live longer they live a couple months um, they store fat bodies and they're they're kind of born to live over the winter and last longer they're not working as hard um, they are keeping the hive you know warm the queen warm all that but they're it's a different kind of um, season for them so they don't live as long during the peak season so um, just to kind of give you a quick overview so the first couple of days of their life they are housekeeper bees they clean the cells they, they keep the brood which is the eggs and the nest warm um, they then from days three four five ish you know they nurse they nanny they feed the older larva um, with the honey and the pollen and so it's kind of cool because as you look at this they work their way a little bit further away from kind of where they just hatched out of which I find super interesting you know um, second week here a nurse or nanny um, they feed the young with the royal jelly the protein you know source that they're getting and then they kind of branch out a little bit and um, days 12 to 17 they do a, a hive builder they produce the wax from their abdomen um, they construct comb they ripen the honey by dehydrating it a bit um, so that's really kind of all cool it's a class in itself the way they make wax and everything they need a lot of nectar and sugar for that making comb it takes a lot of effort so that's um, really really interesting oops sorry um, so then we have security guard bees I like to call them ventilators um, the guard bees are really kind of like at the entrance you'll notice them right when you go to the hive um, they're just like those few bees that are right there like what are you doing what are you, you know you're getting in there kind of you'll, you'll see them and if you just kind of stay very still and don't move too quickly they'll just kind of kind of sniff you out and just say that you're okay don't wear dark colors around beehives they you know you're, you don't want to look like a bear you don't want to wear wool you don't want to smell like an animal um, you know so you just want to kind of that's why the bees suits are white light colors are really good um, so security guard bees you have ventilators um, that ventilate the hive so they do a lot of temperature control inside they try to keep um, the low moisture content um, it's also part of dehydrating the nectar which becomes honey so that's their job at you know this point 18 to 21 days um, and then their last job is um, the, the final weeks is being a forager bee and that's when they like leave the hive they gather the pollen the nectar uh, propolis which is like a bee glue if you guys you know if you know me I've talked about propolis before I have it in the shop um, they get water for the hive you know your hives need a water source we'll get into that um, but these are the jobs that they have and uh, you can actually watch bee movie um, which is really fun I always talk about being movie because it's pretty accurate and it's you know kind of about um, that main character B I forget his name you know played by Jerry Seinfeld <laughs> and he wants to be a forager bee and go out there and so um, you know watch that movie it's pretty cool and you'll you'll kind of relate it to this um, it's pretty pretty fantastic all right so you know after you kind of know a little bit about each of the bees you know you're thinking about starting your hives um, you know they say start with two hives if you can you can compare them um, when you compare hives uh, it's for a number of reasons you might just need to compare personalities and see that several different personalities of a hive can all be normal you might want to compare hives if you have different breeds you want to maybe have Russians and Italians and see what you like better um, also just to see you know you might be doing something wrong uh, you know maybe something's wrong with one and not the other and so it's really kind of good when you're starting out to compare but you don't have to just have two hives it, it can be pricey um, you know we I always recommend you join clubs go online talk to people come into the store talk to me send me emails photos you just want to know what's normal and what's not when you're first starting out it's it's so difficult to kind of know what what the right thing is here so um you know just having two is, is a great recommendation but if you can't you know join groups to know what you're comparing to ask questions send photos to groups pictures emails clubs um, just to do that to compare is good as well um, taking notes with dates and details is huge we have a form if you need one to take notes on your hives and what's going on dates are a really big deal um, sometimes you don't realize that you're like oh was I in there just last week or was it a month ago you know it's it time goes quick um, and you also don't want to be going in there too often or not often enough um, you know some people especially when they first get bees they want to be in there every other day once a week you don't need to do that you really want to be maybe only going in every three to four weeks if everything is okay if you go through your inspection um, and your bees are not okay then that will kind of determine when you go in next and that should be in your notes um, I didn't have a queen I didn't see eggs I want to recheck on that there was a funky smell I thought I saw mites did I do that you know there's things that we're gonna look at um, that will determine your next hive visit um, and you also want to keep 
the weather in mind because if you need to get a visit in, you really want to plan a week before and be like, all right, I know I'm due for a hive inspection. Uh, Wednesday looks good, so let's put aside some time. You would be surprised that things happen, and um, if you're not, you know, kind of coordinating with the weather then, uh, you know, time gets away from you and you don't want things to go too long or too short, you know, so just planning is big. Um, ordering bees usually January, February or so. I have people ask me about bees now and it's and it's hard, it's so painful because I want to tell them, yes, we can get you some bees, but it's late in the season. You know, we're in uh, we're in end of April right now. So a lot of people are getting their bees this week in the next six weeks, um, depending on how you order them. There's a lot of different ways to order them, where to order them, from what parts of the country. Um, again, while it's all very good to join clubs, ask questions, maybe take a class the season before, there's just a lot more to consider than you realize. Um, some people are just like, I want to buy bees and they buy them and they have 10 days to prepare and it's it's a lot. Um, so just to kind of know what's going on. So try to get local bees if you can. They will be better used to your climate. So here in New York, we are trying to get New York or Pennsylvania bees, things like that. There are a lot of bees down south that come up this time of year and packages and stuff. And, you know, that's all right too. It's just you have to kind of think differently what they might be used to, how you're going to prepare them. Um, you know, do, does your hive have comb ready for them? There's a lot to kind of consider that way. Uh, what time of year are you getting them? Are you getting them April, May, June? Um, you know, there's different formats for each company. Um, so that's just something to consider and look into a little bit. Uh, research the types of bees, queens um, that you want. So, you know, here's, uh, I'm actually going to pull this website up for a second. You know, Italian, Corniolan, Russians, you know, all these here. You read about each breed. And what you also want to consider is what do you want to get out of your bees? Do you just want bees to have bees? Do you want to pollinate? Are you looking to get propolis from your bees? Do you want big honey producers? So decide kind of what your goals are and then research your breeds and then go from there to decide, um, you know, what kind you want to get then you can look up your breeders and see you know what you're getting some a lot of companies don't even have what breeds are on there they're just like mass produced and they're just a bunch of bees all right we've got them now and there's not much info about them we try to find certified you know um, we know what their history is we're trying to work with queen um, Varroa hygienic uh, queens that help with mites. They're kind of more naturally bred to like you know the hygiene in them they clean themselves helps with mite um, what is it called? Uh, Might counts, if you want to call it. So that's something we'll get into a little bit later with pests. But um, yeah, so let me just pull this actually up for a minute. I believe I have this here. So just types of bees. So look up articles like this. What is the race of bees? Um, different qualities here, just like I said. Are you looking for resistance to diseases? Do they overwinter well? Um, propolis, uh, likelihood to swarm. So you can really kind of delve in and pick which race that you want. Um, it's great to kind of do this a little, like a season before and really know what you want in your bees and then, and then find them. Um, so yeah, so this is just a perfect bee article. I have most of these articles on my website. If I find a good resource, um, I, I add it to my website here. I'll just show you like the jennybeeproject.com. Um, I have a resources tab. Let's see here, be educated. So here is resources, if I can pull that up. And if I find like a good link, I try to just be like, this is awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome. Um, it's just great. There's so much out there to look at. Um, there's no excuse. Like there's just so much information, so much available info. Um, there's clubs everywhere. This is also another uh, link that I have at the end of this lecture that's just beekeeping clubs in New York State so what's great is the pollinator network at Cornell will have like all these different areas you can click into and find a club near you um, we are trying to start a new one a mini kind of informal club a mixer each month at the shop but we had to cancel our first meeting in March due to the quarantine but we will be rescheduling that because we have a lot of new beekeepers they're excited to meet up um, and talk about their bees. Let's talk about what's happening every month. And um, I have a, a Facebook group on um, a Facebook called Blooming Bees here. So I'll pull that up really quick. Um, Blooming Bees. Yeah, so it's got like 25 people or so. I do not believe a lot of these people are beekeepers yet. Some of them are getting their bees like just right now. So the group's a little bit quiet right now. I'm kind of posting, not getting too much back, but people like it and that's fine. I think once our, our students who are getting bees are a lot of this group here, we'll start posting a lot more. So I'm just going to keep posting resources and stuff, but this is Blooming Bees right here. If you want to join it, you just answer a couple of questions, um, just why you want to join. We just kind of want local beekeepers. I, I started this group because 
because I wanted something kind of within a 10, 15, maybe 20 mile radius of us in Blooming Grove who are experiencing the same weather, you know, the same climate, the same season, the same blooms. Um, there's not too many clubs around here. I think there's one in Warwick that started new. There's not much south of here. So I'm just trying to put something a little bit together. Um, I can never make the meet. I'm always doing a festival, a seminar. I'm working at the shop. So I am just doing like a mixer on a weekday night, usually at seven on a Tuesday or Thursday. It'll be, um, we're waiting to reschedule once everything calms down. I would do a Zoom mixer, but we just, we haven't met yet. So it's just not, you know, going to work. And a lot of these guys don't have bees yet. So I'm just going to post videos and, and so on. So all right, back to the class here. So, okay, so let's see. Um, okay, starting your first hive notes. Okay, so ordering bees, we got to climate research. Okay, so the last thing here on this list is deciding if you would like a, a nucleus colony or a package of bees. So, um, the nucleus colonies are look like this. <laughs> they come with five frames of bees kind of ready to go in a mini beehive basically. Um, this is a couple years back at Man Lake. We were picking up some nukes. Um, they were really kind of getting out of their cages here, but that's okay. That was fine. We had them in the pickup truck and stuff. Um, it was a rainy day, which can kind of be good for getting your bees. Um, they're not flying out as much, so, uh, you know, that was kind of cool. Um, but, yeah, so this is a nucleus colony, and they already are coming with some brood, some pollen, some honey usually. It's usually a mix of four to five uh, frames. So you kind of have something a little bit established with a queen already in there, um, or a package is a little bit different. But let me just go through um this first. So this is a nucleus colony. So this is that same day I was taking photos and we picked up these are chock full of bees. It's awesome. Um, you can see my frame perch here, which I, um, sorry, the frame grip here, which I always talk about. I love this, this tool um, because it's, if you have, you know, janky gloves that are thick, whatever, this is just a great and in, non-invasive way to pick up frames and really inspect them and stuff. Um, so anyways, you are taking these four or five frames, however your nucleus colony may come, and just putting them in your beehive ready to go in the same order. That's how you install a nucleus colony. You don't want to mix this up. You just want to easy, just put them right in, boom, close it up. Um, you know, the queen should be in there. You want to be very gentle. Take out a couple more of these frames here. I'm pointing to in the middle so you have room to just get these in here, slide them over, maybe move these frames over a little bit, get your last frame in. You don't want to roll the bees. You don't want to be just like haphazardly putting them in. You want to just nice and slow, the same order. And like, that's it. Like they're halfway ready to go already. Um, so this was just installing these guys. Oh, let's see. Okay, so... Um, I just want to see if I wanted to say one more, one or two more things on this. Yeah, so you're already a little bit more ahead with the nucleus colony. Um, so now at the, you're going to have five, this is a 10 frame hive. There's eight and 10 frame Langstroth hives we work with, um, but this is a 10 frame. So you're 50% full at this point. So at usually 80, 90% when this box is full of either brood, nectar, pollen, just the frames are full, that's when you might add another box on top here that I'm pointing to. So every time you're about 80, 90% full, you add your, your next box. So this one, if you're in the middle of a nectar flow, you know, maybe it's earlier than that, you, that's the type of stuff you want to keep in mind when you're getting your bees. What time of year are we in? What's going on in my area? Um, a lot of us who are getting New York bees right now are getting them in June. Um, so we'll be like in the middle, middle of the nectar flow possibly because it's, we are having an early season, but uh, let's see, you know, if we get them, we might want to be ready with that next box within a week because, you know, we could fill this up very quickly A five out of 10 or five out of eight frames, especially you're already at 70% full or so. Um, you want to get that next box ready to put on where a package, you have some more time because with the package, if you do not have drawn frame and uh, drawn comb in here, you're going to put that package in and they have have to build all that comb and they need a lot of nectar and sugar water and things to get this box nice and full. Um, that is your goal, to get it full for winter. Don't worry about you getting anything out of it. You just want them to be, um, you know, full and prepared for winter time. Um, but then, you know, you might still get, if this fills up nicely, maybe, you know, in, in a few weeks, a month, maybe you get that second box on it. Again, it depends on what time of year you are getting your package or your nucleus colony. All right, so now we are switching to the package. So this is just one picture of many types of different package bees. They come in plastic, wooden. Um, you'll see all different photos online. It's very good to look at a lot of videos, a lot of pictures, because you might watch one video and are like, all right, I got this down. But then 
you know, you're going to get a different kind of package with a different kind of opening, and then you just, you're not going to know what to do when you get them, and it's a little bit scary your first time. So just watch all different ways to kind of know. Maybe you can even find a photo of the one that the company that you're getting it from, you know, is selling so that you can kind of know what to expect a little bit. There's different kinds of cages. There's different kinds of packages. So um, that's just kind of good to watch a lot of different stuff. So you're going to be installing a queen when you get a package where you do not do that with the nucleus colony. Your, um, let's see here. So you got this package and I'm going to maybe, I have at the end of this, I'll show you. There's so many videos I have attached to my, um, my website. I just can't watch them all with you on this lecture. This is just like a quick like crash course. Then you can go look up everything. Um, but yes, yeah, so you remove this can. This is a can of simple syrup for them just to feed off of. These guys are in swarm mode. They're super gentle. Um, if you saw that video, I was just kind of Pointing to them, actually, I will just show you that for a quick moment since it's already up. This is me with a package a couple weeks ago, a um, different kind of package. Like I said, this is plastic. I'm picking them up. You know, I, I'm not big on this except for when they're in this um, mode. You just pick them right up. They're good, um, good to go. So they're in swarm mode, which means they're not protecting anything. They are... Um, what is it called? Uh, they're not protecting brood. They're not protecting food. There's nothing in here. So they are just kind of keeping the queen warm. The queen, this cage, will be hanging right in your um, food. You know, I'm sorry, right next to the food. Actually, this looks like the where the queen cage hangs um, right in here. And they're just going to keep her warm. They're going to feed her. You might have some attendant bees in the cage with the queen. They come differently. Um, sometimes you'll see some attendant bees in there with her. So when you are installing the queen, uh, I just want to check what's next now. Um, you want to make sure that she is, you, you're going to put her in the middle of the hive here, just like this. You want to make sure that the screen is facing forward or backwards, just not against the, the frames here. Because if she's facing the frame, she can't get any air. Um, the bees cannot tend to her, feed her, etc. Um, and also you want to see this white is the candy. This is like what's feeding them. It's like just a hard sugar candy. This is feeding them from inside. And you want that at the bottom because you do not want this upside down. And then this sugar will be melting because it gets warm. It gets warm in the hive, the moisture, it starts to kind of break up and it will literally drown the bees that are in here. So you put this queen cage in here for a couple of days before you release her so that the bees get used to her, the pheromones. She's already in here a couple of days. If you kind of know how long she's been in this cage, you might want to release her pretty, pretty quickly. You might want to wait a couple of days. That's something you want to ask whoever you're getting the bees from, you know, a little bit of a timeline about that. Um, but yeah, so for these purposes, you're installing the queen like this, then you will be adding your package of bees in there. Um, again, we're not going through all of that right now because this is just the crash course, but just a couple quick highlights. Um, so this is also how you will install a new queen. If you are queenless or you do want to requeen your hive, this is kind of the same process. You have your queen in a cage, you put her in, they get used to her, and then you let her out, you know, either through the cork or, you know, again, that's another whole class because there's there's different types of queen cages, etc. Um, but yeah, that's basically the package versus the nucleus colony. You see the difference here. These guys are going to be a little bit more protective because they do have brood and eggs. You know, if I can, I don't know if I can zoom in here. Let's do this F9. Um, nah, it's a little bit granular, but in here you'll see that brood and stuff, but, um, that's okay. So yeah, they're protecting that. They're going to be a little bit more, you know, just a little more agitated, but that's okay. All right. So we're going to look at types of beehives really quick. Um, so I always get questions on the flow hive. This hive I do not see in our area as often. It's just uh, a little bit maybe harder, I want to say, to insulate. Um, if I see this more just down south, the warmer states, California. Uh, what's, it's a great invention in a way that the honey might be easier to extract, except people just do not realize that you still have to inspect this colony just like you would a regular colony. This is not just like a you turn on the switch thing, honey flows out, yay, that's beekeeping. No, you still have to go in. You have to make sure that your honey is ready to be extracted. There are ways to know that it is at the proper moisture content. It's, um, I, I'm sure you could just turn on a valve and get some honey for the day, but just know that it might not be the right moisture content. It might still be syrup or nectar, not technically honey, which is like a 17, 18% moisture. Um, and then with that, you're just, you know, that's fine. You're having nectar or whatever. Just use it up quickly because it might ferment. 
the reason honey never goes bad is because the bees know when it is at the proper moisture content and they will, um, they, that's when they cap it with wax. That's when they, they, they close the comb with wax. They put a wax capping on it. It's kind of like, um, you know, putting a lid on a jar. They're preserving it. It's good. It's ready. So if you're inspecting your hive and you're like, wow, is this honey ready? Part of that inspection is making sure that you see honey that looks, um, let's see, I think I even have a photo of it, but honey comb with wax, just to like show you images, I love images, like I'll show you both ready and not ready. Um, this right here is not ready, this like comb that I'm pointing to is, um, that's, that's nectar still, so this does not have wax cappings on it, it makes a nice photo, but see how this has wax on it, let me see if I can get this closer without losing the image, um, this is a nice capped honeycomb, there you go, um, that's got proper wax cappings on it, when it's wax like this on a frame, like these are open, this is still nectar, okay, not ready to extract, I'm trying to find like a frame, da, da, da. like I said, I think I have it in this presentation, but just a quick look, um, yep, like right here, like that's wax on top, what did I type in, uh, honeycomb, yeah, so yeah, sometimes you don't get the best. I mean, right here, perfect. That's a nice frame. Um, so that's ready to extract. So if you're just like in this flow hive, uh, you, and you're just opening up your valve or whatever, it might not be ready. And just just understand that. And you still have to treat for for mites, things like that, etc. So just a quick overview. Top bar hive, same thing. A little bit harder in our northeast area to work with but people find ways um a lot of these people build their own um they're a little more expensive but people are really into woodworking they build their own be very careful we get crazy winds and storms in this in this area you want to make sure that this is stable um if you do want to insulate if you're an insulator in the winter you know find a way to insulate this um, the top bar hive is nice because it's more working side to side rather than stacking boxes. So people um, are attracted to this because you can kind of like lift this little lid like a little treasure chest and then your top bar is basically just bars going across. It's not complete frames. Um, so it's very, very fragile as well. Wax is fragile in the summer when it's kind of half melted. So um, just be very careful of that. But it's just a different, different style. But for the sake of what we do, we are always working with like Langstroth um, in most of our classes, everything. I'll always touch on these a little bit. Um, the concepts vary just a little, like I said, because this goes side to side rather than not up. So your brood might be in the center still, um, but your honey frames are going to be to the side rather than your honey being on top. But again, for another class. <laughs> All right, the Skep Beehive. So these are really gorgeous, but they are illegal. Um, they're just, they're not, they're not inspectable really. So that's part of what we look for when we're buying a beehive and why beehives came to be the way they are. Um, the Langstroth hive is an inspectable hive with removable frames, which is what you need um, to be like properly, you know, keeping bees. So like this is really great and natural and cool. Um, but in order to even extract honey from this, like you would just have to kill the whole hive. Like it's just a little different. Um, you know, they're just, you know, other countries, you know, may still use them. There's all different kinds, but here we have to use, um, what is it called, a, a hive with removable frames, but it's pretty cool to see. There's, there's all different ways to do this. And, you know, you can keep bees like this and just for pollination and so on. It might not be great for honey, um, but again, just all depends on why you're keeping bees. But, you know, that's just a little note on that. And these are really cool. These are like log um, frames. I've seen people make these. Uh, with removable frames inside so just I'm not sure what's inside all these I've watched videos of people make them because I think they're really cool they probably have really great insulation you know a couple inches thick but what I've seen people do is take a really big log cut out a middle area here put maybe some of the mini frames the half frames in here as maybe their base and their brood chamber then they maybe start to put regular Langstroth boxes on top of them so that's kind of cool so you can watch videos but again make whatever but just make sure that they are removable and inspectable frames um, so that you can check on everything and make sure you know you can manipulate what you need to uh, we have basically domesticated bees they're not you know wild so we have to be responsible um, which is why I'm so big on education. I never get, you know, annoyed when people ask questions, a million questions. I'd rather you know. I'm happy when people ask and not just, like, assume that they know. Um, there's a lot to take on. So, um, so yeah, just always ask questions, watch, watch videos. So this is our Langstroth beehive here, which we are normally working with. Um, the equipment that I carry is 8 frame and 10 frame. Um, this picture here is a 10 frame hive. Uh, this is a great little picture to just kind of see all the different components and we do a whole class on this. Um, but this is an awesome just kind of like 
basic you know starter we have our stand here which some people get some people don't again depends on your setup this one does not have a stand it just has your bottom board i do put um this thing keeps coming up here sorry uh some bricks underneath mine I really like working with the bricks rather than any wooden stands because I do feel that the wood attracts like pests, ants, uh, things like that, uh, beetles. Um, it rots a little bit over time when the water just kind of keeps moving to the same spot. So I really like to work with um, just cement, just four cinder blocks, boom, 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 boom. Um, I put a ratchet strap around them. So I like to keep my two cinder blocks where I can put a ratchet strap right through like this where you see my arrow. Keep them together. We get high winds. We're a little up on a mountain, a hill. Um, up here so we get these high winds so just good to kind of know you know your setup uh, these are brood chamber deep boxes for your brood um, there are two of them here and then they go to a honey super after that um, some people do overwinter with just one some people are switching to two or three medium boxes to create their brood chamber rather than these deeps they get very very heavy uh, see like just example here this is one and then your honey supers there are a lot of variations of ways to go a lot of people including myself are switching their equipment to eight frame because again it's just lighter bees do like to work a little bit more um, you know thinner and work their way up they don't have to be so wide uh, it could be easier to insulate um, pros and cons to everything you know one big box like this could be great because they're you know their population will be nice and high if you're reducing this back down for winter just a lot to consider when you're getting your setups which is again why I really recommend kind of doing your research a year before a few months before whatever you may you know um, the time you may need I, I always recommend like a class and just just even a crash course that you like this that you just know where to start and then can research beyond here and then decide how you want to keep your bees um, but yeah so this is just basics you got stand bottom board I love screened bottom boards for varroa maintenance and ventilation um, this is an entrance reducer here this reduces your entrance at different times of year where you may want less or more wind coming in there might be more traffic for the bees where you open this way up in the summer you might close it with a little notch here um, in the winter um, you might put a mouse guard in front of here for the winter again we that's like a whole class in itself just going through all of these parts um, queen excluder here this is to help know sometimes where the queen is sometimes it is just to keep her below in this chamber so that she is only laying eggs here and then the worker bees can bring in honey and nectar up here um, not everybody uses these sometimes the bees just happen to lay more you know in these lower chambers anyway so you don't need it um, there's a lot of reasons to use or not use a queen excluder but basically it's um, a little screen kind of in a way with holes in it that the queen stays below um, she's bigger she cannot get through this screen so only the worker bees and stuff can really get up here to then deposit their nectar you know for the day or whatever and, and that's where you get your honey supers so at the end of the season you can like take these off extract the honey and then like reduce your hive you know to get ready for winter um, some people even including myself I'll keep a honey super on but I'll just do a few frames at a time and just keep letting them do frames of honey that I extract so I'm not lifting a whole box there's so many different ways to do this but again this is just a crash course so then you got your uh, inner cover here there are screened inner covers solid inner covers there's pliable inner covers I work with this one in the photo here it's a cartoon but I like it I used to use screens it was a mess there was a lot of extra wax and burr comb um, they call it burr burr comb um, in here that the bees will basically build comb anywhere that there is larger than three eighths of an inch space um, it's just what they do it's um, just called bee space actually <laughs> and so they'll just build that comb wherever there's just like random space so it's just something to be aware of if they're starting to build a little burr comb on the bottom of your inner cover here that probably means you need to add your next box so that's something you can look for um, and you can always just scrape it off a little bit but uh, like I said when I was using the screens it was just a disaster and I just like to um, I just use this all year now the solid inner cover it's got a little hole in here you can use for feeding and stuff um, and then you got your your outer cover all different kinds of outer covers um, this is a telescope outer cover we sell this one we sell a migratory one um, there are some fancy more formal outer covers uh, there are some more plastic kind of outer there's all different kinds but um but yeah we usually go with this telescope one here that actually that's this here with the metal um, that you know reflective kind of attracts some sun some heat so that can be good and then you got your frames inside you know so these are 10 frames just a little image 
Uh, and then you got frames and foundations. So I think I go into that a little bit, but let me just see. Yeah, so I'm going to go through them a little bit more in depth, but let's see. Okay, so I think we kind of went over this a little bit. Um, I just wanted to see, yep, movable frames. That's what I wanted to make sure. This, this is in here, um, and I can always email somebody these slides. I'm happy to um, just email you a PDF of these so you just have some notes that you can look over. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is kind of what we just went over a little bit, why certain hides are better than others in certain areas. Um, let's see, yep, we went over all this. Perfect. So this is what those bottom boards I was just talking about. Um, so I love this screened bottom board. I, the solid bottom boards are okay. I just like that you can remove this corrugated um, Varroa mite monitoring sheet here. Um, and that way, like, they have this ventilation, especially in the summer. And also, like, all the debris from the hive that they are, you know, walking around, they're cleaning it up, there's pollen falling, this and that. They can just fall right through to the bottom. Um, and, and just even if you sometimes use a leaf blower, just naturally it blows away. That's great. Instead of building up here, where if you have a solid bottom board, you have to kind of clean this debris, almost like a hamster cage. It's like this stuff is falling. Um, and also, you don't have to worry about the tilt on your hive where if you have a little water buildup, you want to make sure that your hives are tilting a little bit forward. So if you have any rain, you know, catching here that the rain falls out, with the screen you don't have to worry about that as much. Um, you can, you know, just use your screen here and that's fine. And then you have these guys and I still have mine in right now, these corrugated boards. Um, and I flip them over every couple days. Like, so there, I had some old comb that I had uh, a couple of the hides cleaning up. So right when I um, put those uh, new frames in, there was just all this debris falling and I could see it now. It's kind of calming down. It, it tells you a lot about what's going on in the hive. You see this debris fall, you slide this guy out. You're going to see what's fallen off. Um, but this is also a way to check your Varroa mites. You can like put Crisco or Vaseline on this thing. You can put a sticky board on there to count your mites. You put it in, you wait 24, 48 hours, whatever type of test you're doing. You see how many mites fall. Um, onto this board. This here is a design just to help your eyes count the, the mites. Um, and then if you have X amount of mites per X amount of hours, then you there's a little table ratio of, of knowing if your mite count is a little bit high, maybe you need to treat for mites. Um, you should just like treat anyway, <laughs> but this is a great monitoring system if you want to, you know, monitor every month or so, every, you know, four or six, eight weeks. Um, and check your mite count, see what's going on, and know if you need to treat. Um, but that's kind of what this board is, but it, it has many purposes. Okay, so we are talking about frames. Um, and this is what I'm going through a lot with my, my classes right now, even though we went through this a little bit, when you're actually getting to it and choosing your setup and your frames, do you want to go foundationless completely? If you do, that's okay. And you might want to add a little starter strip of comb right here where I'm putting my pointer, just to get them started with something to know that that is where they should build comb. This will take a very long time for them to build this comb. So again, depending on what time of year you're getting your bees, are you getting them in April, are you getting them in June? Are they going to have enough time to build enough comb to overwinter? That is our goal the first year, is to make sure they are full of resources um, this first year to overwinter well and, and have a place to store everything, a place to lay eggs. Um, so it's good to kind of start with some type of foundation. I, I recommend it um, at first because she needs to lay eggs. She needs to get in there. If not, you know, they're not going to be super happy. So um, this is wire as a foundation. So if you still you still should put a starter strip here of wax. Um, I use the crimp wax for that. Um, you can just install that right on top. And this is just to give... Uh, some structure to comb when they're building it. So if they're building natural comb like this up here, they will build it right into the wire. And again, the wire can help when, um, like I talked about earlier, like if, if you're in the heat of summer, it's the height of summer, sorry, the heat actually makes the wax like very pliable, like where in the winter the wax will be like, what, you know, rock hard. Um, this will just like flail and just be a little bit fragile. So you, sometimes this wire just helps give a little quote unquote foundation. Um, you can add foundation in there. Let me see. Yep, like these. So this is like, there's plastic foundation, there's wax foundation, there is max wax foundation. There are so many kinds. Um, we sell at the shop mostly the wax 
max foundation over the plastic so it's, it gives a nice layer of, of thick wax for them to start out and start drawing out um, to create this over here. Um, also we have that that crimp wax, is that in here? Uh, nope, but that's that could be here with the wire. Um, that they can draw out as well. So there's there's all different foundations you can do. This is a top bar hive with frames that are super small to make comb. If you if you're interested in making comb honey, there are frames just for that. This is a Ross Rounds comb frame. They will build into any area. Oh, I have so many photos of really cool. There's so many inventions people make up. Again, you know the biology of the bees and what they're going to do. They're going to fill up anything that's three eighths of an inch. Um, so you just kind of use that to make the decisions on on how you want to you know keep your bees. Um, all right, we're going to entrance reducers now. So we are looking at different times of year, uh, how you want to keep your ventilation and stuff. So this is the one down here, this little cartoon is what I had in that other photo I was talking about. So this is where you can turn this little mini stick of wood depending on what time of year it is. Um, right now I'm either using this, oh, oops, this um, size or this size to use my... Uh, as my entrance. Um, this size is great because you can fit most of these, not all of them, most of them you can fit a Boardman feeder into this and the bees can still get out around it a little bit which is good. So uh, so that's kind of nice this time of year when it's still a little bit cold, cold nights. Um, but sometimes you want to leave this open and the bees, if you have a nice thick colony um, going, you need that ventilation. So having the air is better than not having the air. What will kill the bees is moisture and moisture build up that then like kind of like a greenhouse effect, it will rain back down onto the bees um, rather than, uh, you know, just keeping it dry and, and like kind of this cross ventilation going on with like a top cover with a like a top entrance here, um, some ventilation holes, you know, maybe your top inner cover. Usually uh, try to get them with a notch. They don't always come with a notch, but a nice notched inner cover is good because you'll have a top entrance that will allow the air to come through, um, which is great. There's more on that. Again, in, in the, in the class, I could say so much, but um, where you put that top cover, the notch facing the front, facing the back. Um, you don't want to create a super crazy cross breeze in the middle of winter, so there's ways to place it. Email me. I'll answer your questions. Um, People make their own little entrance reducers. That's cool. This is an entrance that is a pollen trap. So basically the bees crawl through here and uh, the, the pollen falls right off of their legs into this tray that you take the tray out, you get your pollen. It's another one. There's all different types of these pollen traps. This is another little entrance. You can make your own. Um, over here we have some hardware cloth over the entrance reducer. You can use a mouse guard. You want to maybe have some metal over your entrance reducers in the winter because the mice will get through. They will just chew through the wood. They'll chew through this cork. Um, having something metal over it or a mouse guard is, is a great way to uh, make sure the bees can get in and out if they need to or do some cleansing flights, but the, the mice will not come through. Um, but that's what you want to consider is like safety, ventilation, um, you know, that they can security, security guard their own their own hives. So like maybe it's fall and you want to make it a little bit smaller, um, a little at a time, just so that they, you know, if they're clustering at night into a small ball, they, they're not going to be at the entrance necessarily waiting for predators. So that's kind of the stuff you're considering when you're um, changing out your entrances. Okay, brood chamber. So we talked about this a little bit, your first couple of boxes at the bottom. Um, maybe you're doing one big box, maybe you're doing two medium boxes, maybe there's all different configurations, but that nest is the brood chamber. However you configure it, it is the brood chamber where they lay their eggs, they store pollen um, and honey for their young, like that's like what you don't want to touch. You want to make sure they have enough resources in there. So the honey is their carbohydrate source and pollen is their protein source. Um, wax can be their lipids, their fats, um, and so these chambers should always be left for the bees and we are checking on brood patterns when we're doing inspections make sure it's a nice healthy full brood pattern check for eggs check for evidence of a queen that is vital in like your your um, inspections and your checklist and also you want to when you're looking at your brood chamber too you want to make sure that there is enough room for her to lay eggs you don't want it to be where your frames are so full of honey, say just by accident, maybe there was a honey flow and these bees came came in and were like, oh, we're just going to fill everything with honey and there's nowhere for the queen to lay. You might want to extract some of those frames at that point and um, change them out maybe for some, some drawn empty comb 
where she can lay. Uh, you know, that might be if you have a queen excluder on, maybe if not, you just want to put another box on um, if you don't have a queen excluder, but just things to keep an eye on that you want to have a good ratio of your brood to honey to pollen. Um, so usually what you'll see is brood in the middle and then like your frames will start to be food sources on the outer edges of the, the boxes. Um, so here's what I was just talking about with the brood patterns. So like usually in the middle of a frame, you will see a brood pattern like this. This is a nice brood pattern here. Sometimes your whole frame will be really full of brood, but it's usually in the middle and it's like a rainbow. We're going to have brood in the middle. You're going to have your um, pollen here right next to it. The protein is going to be right next to your babies and your larvae and everything. Um, and then your honey, your carbohydrates are going to be on the outer edges of this frame. Um, and then basically the nurse bees, feeding bees, all of that are going to just have all of this really local right to them to raise the young into the next generation. Um, and this is kind of what you're looking for. You want to look for this brood patch. That means there are there's a queen laying. You want to see different ages of bees. So um, just keep following my pointer. You want to see, um, let's see, right over to the left here, there's smaller, couple day old. Um, got eggs into larva, into pupa, into, you know, then they basically cap them um, and then they hatch out. So there is also, do I have it here? Yes. Um, worker brood versus drone brood versus queen cells. So this is something to also keep an eye on and what you should know. In the middle here is your worker brood. The picture we just saw before is what you're, you're seeing a lot of. It's going to be a little bit flatter. Um, it does, it's not like honey. Honey is up here. This is honeycomb. You can see the difference. This is brood. So just keep an eye on that difference. Now in the middle here you're seeing worker brood, the females. Now you see on the outside here or the lower parts of the frame you're usually going to see the drone brood. If there's any you don't always see it, it's it's a little different. Um, you're going to see it more bubbly, popcorn looking, a little thicker, a little bigger. Um, drone brood is bigger and it actually is more susceptible to mites for that reason. Mites like it. Um, mites are love to be inside this brood because, um, uh, especially drones, because they can get an extra cycle themselves, a life cycle. They just reproduce and reproduce and reproduce inside these um, these cells here, and they can get an extra cycle out of that with the with the drones because it's bigger. They have an extra day, a little bit more time to reproduce, um, so they are attracted to this. So sometimes, if you are monitoring, you can even break a few of these guys open. There's a tool for that. Look at that drone brood, see what it looks like. Are there mites on it? You'll see them right there. We'll show you pictures later. That's something to keep an eye on. All right, you got your queen cells here. So if you are seeing a lot of these, um, it's natural for them to just be around sometimes. Um, but also, you will you want to check these. Are they full? Are they ready to swarm? Are they trying to requeen? Are you seeing a lot of them? Are they just making a couple emergency cups, which they sometimes do? So this is something to keep an eye on. Um, if you don't want them to swarm, you might just want to like rip these off a little bit and just kind of flick them off or smush them, um, so they don't re requeen and swarm. They will create a new queen. Uh, you know, to when they're swarming, they're taking the um, original queen with them and then they're leaving a new queen there to hatch and then have a new hive. So just something to keep an eye on, a few ways to control a swarm. It's a whole nother class as well, but yeah. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, yeah, your bees come first. Just make sure that your, uh, your bees have all the resources they need before you are taking their resources. Um, make sure they are full of honey. They need 50 to 100 pounds of honey themselves to overwinter depending on the size of your colony. Um, you can always put a candy board on top, which I do. If they don't need it, great. If they do, you, you, we don't know what the weather is going to be. We don't know what's going to happen. So just be prepared for anything. Um, and also same with pollen. If you're putting those pollen traps on, don't leave it on all the time. You want them to get pollen. Protein pollen is huge for them to raise good young. Um, if you're giving them pollen substitute, pollen patties, kind of pollen equals babies. You want to make sure that they are, um, they have that pollen to raise healthy, healthy young. So you don't want to take all of it. Maybe take a little bit, you know, take the I think that specific one we showed you has like an entrance that you can open and close and there's all different kinds, but you just want to make sure you're not taking all of their, their resources, just, you know, a little at a time. Okay, queen excluders. So we showed you these in the cartoon a little bit, but this is a better image to show you how these, um, the worker bees, see how they can climb through here, but the queen bee is too big to um, climb through. You're going to read different things. Um, you know, people, I never say what the right way is. Everyone has their own experience of this. And so um, some people do not like to use queen excluders. They say it damages the wings of the workers. Um, you know, there's all different 
philosophy. Some people like to use this to keep a, maybe they're only one over winter with one box, so they are keeping all their honey supers above. Maybe you're splitting hives. So this is a tool to use if you are trying to split a beehive. You want to know if the queen is in this box, in this box. So there's a lot of reasons to use a queen excluder. Um, some people don't use them at all. I have hives that I just don't use them for. I just let them go wherever they want to go. When one box is full, I add another one, and I can use that as a resource hive, let them be how they want to be. Um, if I need whatever frame, a honey frame, a brood frame, or whatever, I grab it from that hive to give to another hive. So there are all different ways to keep bees, but again, as long as you really understand like their biology and what they want to do and what weather they're going to do it in, <laughs> that's, that's going to help you make decisions for your bee yard. Um, okay, so the honey supers. Uh, so this is just a lot of photos of stuff. There's a lot of things I'm manipulating here, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, you can use medium honey supers. You can use shallow honey supers. Um, the three sizes you're mostly going to see, I like to refer to them as shallow, medium, and deep. It's just the easiest way. Instead of talking about the inches and nine and whatever eighths, and it's, you know, I, I just say shallow, medium, deep. The shallows are good for honey because uh, I actually don't have a picture in that here. I apologize. Um, these are mediums up top. And uh, what is it called? So the shallow will be like an inch shorter than this. And because they're just, they weigh a lot. And so you are, um, what is it called? Picking up, you know, honey. If you're just going to extract the entire uh, box or super, then it's heavy. So it's just, they're usually a little bit shallower, but you can do it with mediums. You can just take a few frames at a time. Um, a lot's going on in these photos. So it's, you know, whatever. But <laughs> anyways, um, we're just going to go into those inner and outer covers again. See these notch that I was talking about? This notch will give you that ventilation up top. So you want to face it forward in the winter and maybe back in the back of the hive, this notch, in the summer because that will give it that cross breeze. That cross breeze might be too strong in the winter. So face your, your notch, your top entrance uh, hole for them to get in and out of in the front um, you know, for winter, back, summer. You know, It's kind of rule of thumb. Uh, you can also just use these covers um, for feeding. And so this is just putting, oh, I hate this little thing at the bottom, sorry. This is just using kind of a mason jar style over um, an inner cover just as a, as a box you're, you're feeding inside. Sometimes feeding like this is nice because you can uh, protect it a little bit from robber bees, from pests. Um, you can feed in the front as well with the Boardman feeder. Um, that's nice because you can see how quickly they're taking in the syrup, the sugar syrup. Um, your syrups and sugar will change from season to season. You're going to do like a one-to-one -one ratio in the summer, two-to-one, three-to-one in the fall, um, or maybe early spring, a little thicker syrup. Um, there is research that shows that using how does this go? The using the different ratios will not, I don't know how to word this. Um, I'll actually just talk about the experiments a little bit. You say you're using a one to one um, as opposed to a two to one. They will just take in that two to one ratio a little bit slower, um, but it's doing the same thing. They're going to take in what they need. It's not going to like expedite anything. Like it's not going to be like, I'll take in two to one or three to one syrup in a week as opposed to one to one in a week um, and it's going to produce more. No, it's they're just going to take it in slower. Um, that is what research is showing. So they'll take what they need. Um, so maybe your your two to one will last a little bit longer, but it's it's doing a little bit more per um, what they're taking in, if that makes sense. If, if you want information about that research, let me know and I'll send you um, the articles and the research and the data about that because it's a little bit tricky to explain out of context. Um, so now we have our sugar here. You can just use some, some granulated sugar on newspaper on top of your hive. You can make a candy board out of uh, sugar. There's recipes for this. You can buy sugar patties. You can buy fondant. You can make fondant. I have some recipes on that. Um, but you want to put this on in the winter as a backup source of sugar. You're using a solid sugar at this point because um, say you're using liquid sugar. Uh, one, it might freeze. Um, it freezes at pretty low temps, but uh, they cannot dehydrate it fast enough to get into the, the colony, into their frames where it will, um, it might go bad. It might actually just like, they can't dehydrate it. It's going to go bad in there. You're going to have sick colonies. So you want to use some dry, good, you know, stuff that will last through the winter and not go bad for them. Um, better to do this a little bit early than try to use sugar too f sugar syrup too far into the season. This top feeder here, I'm not a fan of. Um, I don't even know if this is my photo or just one I took, but this is, uh, they drown in this one. I'm not a fan of it. I have used ones if anybody wants them, they're yours, but just not a fan. I like the Boardman feeder and a candy board. 
um, easy, classic. Uh, I can see how much they're taken in, easy to refill. Um, yeah, so that's about it on covers and feeding a little. And now your outer covers. So like we were saying earlier, this is going to be your telescope cover. I do not have a picture of the migratory cover that we also sell. Um, I will actually just pull that up real quick. Migratory B cover. Because they, you can stack these. Um, these are kind of made to like, like you can stack bees. This is Dayton. Um, if you're if you're moving a lot of hives on like a pallet or something, you kind of do this like crisscross stacking with these guys. Um, Migratory B cover stacked hives. I just like to show images if I can. Come on. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, like see the stacking. Oh, these aren't really good for that, like the back and forth. Yeah, well, that's like stacked on some pallets and stuff, but I don't know if they're back and forth necessarily. But yeah, there's just migratory covers. Just a little on that. But yeah, just find what's right for you. Um, the telescope might be a little bit more winter hardy. Uh, but, you know, just paint things. You can always give things fresh paint every year. You can have these, like, fancy, you know, uh, covers. There's English garden covers. Um, there's there's all different covers. But this is kind of like your classic. This is what you, you see a lot around here. Um, let's see. Oh, hive placement. Okay. So this one is kind of like when you're first getting your bees, you really want to decide this before you get your bees, where you are putting your hive, what is important. Sun becomes so important because you really need your bees to be dry. These two right here, sun and dry is going to help with hygiene, um, small pests, large pests, beetles, mites, um, just they're going to be very hygienic the more sun. It also gets them foraging early in the morning. Um, so you want to have maximum exposure. So they're going to get a full day's work that way. Um, if they can face south, great. It gives them an early start. There are also some certain blossoms that only really blossom in the early part of the day. So, uh, so sometimes having those bees out if you need pollination on pumpkins or whatever, excuse me, um, you know, that having them work early when the sun is rising is great. Um, and also that, that dry area, good drainage, maybe even some rocks underneath. You don't want mud and things where like beetles can like fall down, reproduce, come back up into the hive. Um, just a lot of things to consider. We have some, some wet area here where we live. So we try to keep, like I said, on the cinder blocks um, in the highest part of the property and facing the sun. Um, some people make little gravel beds. That's cool. Um, yeah, there's just all different things you can do. Uh, water source nearby um, that has some organic matter in it. That's like their minerals, some of their nutrition, Pond Creek. They, they don't mind mucky water. They actually smell it more than they see it, so that's always good. Um, yeah, so most areas that have nectar pollen nearby, they, you want something for them to forage. They can travel, you know, up to three miles or so for pollen and nectar, you know, sometimes further. Um, but yeah, the less time for, for these resources and, and water, the better. So even if you don't have um, maybe like a water source, a creek, something nearby, make a little uh, bird bath or something with stones in it, rocks. Um, you can just make these. Um, that's that's totally fine. You want to have this also, not just for the bees, but that so that they're not going to like your neighbor's pool, like into your neighbor's yard for stuff. Like you might get complaints that way. It depends on where you live. If you have a few acres, cool. If you are in a very um, close-knit area with neighbors on top of you, you, you got to be very careful. I think they recommend roughly four hives to a quarter acre, which actually sounds like a lot. But um, yeah, so just be careful about that. You want to make sure you have all resources available so they're not bugging other people where you might not want them to go. Uh, let's see, last year, a wind block, of course. Um, the, mm, sorry, the more you can, I keep trying to scroll down. That's why that's happening. It's my habit. So uh, yeah, wind block is really good. You can make this by um, using fence line. You can put shrubs in the way, uh, sheds, a natural tree line. You know, any of these things will help you. Um, just wind block is really good. Sometimes I even, if I'm getting a crazy windstorm coming, I'll even just put some insulation board just back on, even if it's the middle of summer, just so it's not whipping up through the hive. Uh, you know, just just be cognizant of that. It just depends on how they're facing, what what entrances are in. Um, yeah, you just want to keep in mind, you know, keep that in mind, especially with like these polar vortex, really cold, you know, streaks that we get in January, February, you know, negative X amount degrees with the wind, it could be a little rough. So just keep that in mind. All right, spring prep and splitting hives. Um, 
so yeah, you're getting your bees, maybe you're in your second year, there's a couple things to consider. So spring is arriving, and this is kind of what we what we do in our five-week course is we'll take this, we'll break a lot of this down into the seasons of beekeeping. Um, so spring prep, say it's kind of now, so whether it's your second year, third year, whatever your, your year's into this, um, or you have new bees, I'll, I'll kind of go through each one. So um, cleansing flights will be happening. So if you... Uh, you know, you have your bees, say you're in the second year or so on. Um, this is a time of year where you get warm days. The bees will fly about 55 degrees and above. So they're holding their bathroom basically for, for days, weeks on end, and they will do cleansing flights when they can. So this is um, this is why you'll see some bees in the middle of winter. You might even see some snow out still and you get a warm day and the snow is melting, but the bees will be out and they're just letting loose and just kind of relieving themselves. Um, so that's what might be happening in, in the springtime, late late winter, uh, they're going to be removing debris from the hive, but if they cannot, and there's a lot of debris on the bottom of the hive in the winter, you have bees dying every day, it's normal. Maybe um, on a warm day, if you get out there, um, eh, maybe not you know, too warm because you don't want them flying, but you might want to take out your entrance reducer, take a stick or a yardstick, and just clean out the bottom of that hive to, to make sure that that ventilation is there, that there's not a bunch of dead bees at the bottom getting everybody else sick. Um, you know, they, they can get out so many bees, but at that time of year, you just want to make sure that there's not, you know, a couple hundred dead bees at the bottom of the hive. Also, for the purposes that they don't, you don't want those dead bees to be blocking the entrance. Um, so at this point, you do also want to have, when you're putting your entrance reducers back in, putting them with, uh, it's hard to explain. Let me just go back for a minute to, oops, um, to show you a picture of that, which way it should go in. Let me see. Not that one. Okay, right here. Not this way. See this entrance inducer in the hive? Turn it upside down in the winter because you want them to be able to climb over this little bar here, over the dead bees. Um, if they have dead bees blocking the entrance and this entrance is facing down, they might not be able to get in and out of the hive or have ventilation. So that's just something to consider. You want them to be able to climb over that. Um, again, more on that in in-depth in classes or email me for questions on that. But let's see, where were we? There's a lot here, and this is usually a two, three hour course to get people ready. So let's see, yeah, here we are. Okay, present. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so basically if we're also in spring, you might want to consider a pollen patty. Um, so I have a couple pollen patties in my hives right now. I usually take a pollen patty. Um, it's usually a couple, maybe like 10 inches, eight inches long, depending on where you're getting it. Um, and I, I break pieces off at a time because I just, I have beetle prone land. So if they're not eating it too quickly, sometimes it attracts beetles and pests. It's a little bit cool right now. So I, I don't have too big of an issue with that, but it's something you want to keep an eye on that you're not putting a huge patty out there. They're not eating it fast enough. And then you have ants and pests and whatever. Um, but it's good. Yeah. So a pollen patty can also get them, um, rearing brood and the queen laying a little bit sooner. You don't want it to be too soon. Also, once you start feeding pollen, you do not want to stop um, necessarily until the flow. You don't want to like give it to them, not give it to them. Uh, if they have, you know, if they're increasing their population, because that's what pollen does, the protein kind of gets them being like, all right, it's time to start growing. The queen will lay. Um, and then if you just don't have enough food or pollen or, or sugar water, whatever it is, then they're gonna, you're going to have this big pollinate and you might still have a dearth and the bloom did not happen yet. The nectar flow is not on yet and then they will starve. So you just want to keep those things in mind. If you're going to start to feed, you will have an increase in population and then um, you want to make sure that they have that at least until the natural flows are on. Um, also to keep in mind, if you are feeding, say, sugar water or something, uh, if they don't need it, they will not take it. Um, but if you are feeding them that, if you're then putting on honey supers, take off any feed. You don't want to be putting sugar, feeding the bees sugar, and then they're making that into your quote unquote honey, and it's not real honey. So just things to keep in mind. Once you have honey supers on, you're not feeding feeding them. Um, if you need to feed again in the middle of, say, August, September, whatever, great. Just take those honey supers off because that's your real honey from nectar, and then um, you know be feeding them again to be gearing up for winter. Uh, let's see. So this is also when we are keeping an eye on how big our colonies are. Do we want to make splits this year? Are they going to swarm? Um, there's a couple ways. If you want to keep the, the hive the same and not split it, there's things you can do. You might want to rotate your boxes and put the top on the bottom, bottom on the top. They, they tend to work their way up in the winter, eating all of the resources, um, and then they're going to be in the top. They don't go back down. They just they like to be moving upwards. So you might want to put that top box on the bottom, you know, change it up. 
a little bit, but also if they are full, full, they might be, you oh, know, I want a swarm. So you might see swarm cells. And that's where you have to make your decisions what you want to do. Are you going to try to add more boxes, kill the swarm cells? Do you want to split them, get more hives for your apiary, which is a very good idea because you do want to remain sustainable without having to keep purchasing hives if you lose hives, and you will lose hives because that is normal. Um, something to think about. It's expensive. So you, you do want to kind of have an idea that you're going to want to split eventually, um, Couple, couple different ways to do that. That's its own class, but just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, this is when you're thinking about your reducers, your ventilation. You know, we're going from winter to spring to summer. You're going to probably have that entrance reducer wide open in the middle of summer. Um, so just think about that. Uh, let's see, we have erratic weather, like I explained earlier. So day to day, things change where you're like, all right, we're in spring, and then it snows the next day. And it is a lot for the bees to handle. And that's part of climate change. But we need to kind of help them along with that. We, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, we kind of created some of this climate, these climate change issues, and now uh, nature pays for it too. So we have to be really cognizant of those changes. Okay, so this is what we're talking about with swarming. Swarming is a really, like, it's a great healthy sign of a really good hive. Um, so some people are like, oh, they're swarming, that's bad. No, it's, it's a good thing, but you can try to, like, manipulate it a little bit. So usually when the colony grows too big, um, it might want to naturally divide itself. If there's not enough room, it'll say, hey, we need more room, and half the hive will kind of take off, and scout bees will then find their next new location. Um, so like I said, this could be from lack of space, uh, just it naturally wants to do this. This is just part of, you know, what happens. So the primary swarm is usually strong and arrives with a queen that is ready to go to work. Um, and the old colony has sufficient bees, um, so it, it can split into a, several different swarms. This is just a picture of a swarm on a tree. So they take their, their original queen, they go off with a, a population. Scout bees then from here will be like, all right, let's find our new home. So they might move a few times before finding their final destination. And they do like a dance and they, they dance more vigorously the better they find of a location. And they communicate that way until they're like, all right, guys, we finally unanimously decided this is going to be our new house. And then the swarm will follow into their final destination of which then you know beekeepers get phone calls that there's bees in my house and bees in my attic and and so on um so yeah that will happen and then in the uh the hive that they left the original hive um they basically have left a queen cell that's about to hatch with some nurse bees and stuff that are ready to have a new colony so if your swarm if your hive has swarmed that that's okay like just know that it's smaller again um, they might only have 20, 30,000 bees, 20, 000, whatever it may be. That's okay. It's just that you're going to be small again. Maybe, maybe your hive is too big at that point. Maybe if you have three or four boxes on and half of them left, you might, and you go back the next week and you're like, oh man, half my, my colony swarmed. You might need to reduce that size back down, keep an eye on that and so on. Um, but you can also try to split your hive naturally, you know, naturally swarm, manipulate, I don't know how to say that, manipulate it. Um, so it's natural, but it's like we're manipulating it our own way. All right. Pests, the big section here. So, um, all right, pests are big. Pests are things that people do not consider much when getting into bees and don't realize how much you have to consider. So I always start with Varroa mites. Um, they're like the biggest threat to bees. You, you really just, everybody's got mites um, at some point. So we want to be monitoring that or just treating regardless. You can monitor with sticky boards like we talked about earlier. You can put that board on, see how many mites fall, fall through, count it, see what your threshold is, um, and then treat. And I have charts on that. Um, it depends on how big your, your hive is, how many mites might indicate that you have an issue. You can do a sugar roll, an alcohol wash, which is where you take the bees, um, put them in like a mason jar with these, with either sugar or alcohol. You, um, you kind of swish them around. With the alcohol, it will kill the mites. Uh, you put hardware cloth on top of this mason jar, turn it upside down, see how many mites fall out of the hardware cloth. And again, you're doing that ratio for a cup of bees, usually about 300 bees, to see if you need to treat. Um, so there's just a few ways to, to check it. And again, that's a whole class of itself. But look into those. Um, and you definitely want to treat at the height of the season because the, the highest populations are usually around August, September when it's like they've, they've grown the most, but they're also kind of getting ready to reduce in size for winter, of which they kick out all of the drone bees. Um, they then, uh, you know, start to reduce in population, but the mite populations are, are the highest. So you'll look at charts and see... Um, you know, they're starting to decline, mites are at their highest peak, and that's when they're super, super vulnerable, and, and you want to treat at that point to make sure that they are going into the winter in a, in a good, um, 
in a, in a good space. You want you don't want them to be sick or ill or full of mites going into winter. They won't make it. All right, hive inspections to check. You want to check for beetles. Um, you want to make sure that the comb looks good. Are you queenless? Are you queen right? These are things you're looking for in your inspection and your inspection list. Um, how are your food sources? Like we talked about that ratio of your frames. How much brood do you have? How much pollen do you have? How much honey do you have? Um, are you honey bound? Like we said, do they have enough room to lay eggs? Um, let's see. Are pests, you know, scratching at the entrance of the hive? Uh, let's see. So here we go. We've got the varroa mite we just talked about. It attaches itself to the bee. Um, let's see. Okay, so the treatments we were talking about. So now I talked about testing them a little bit, but the treatments can be formic acids, oxalic acids, um, vaporizing. Um, you can do what they, this, they call these chemical treatments. There's soft chemicals, there's hard chemicals, like formic acid, for example, is an organic chemical. Um, Apivar strips might be a more of a harsher chemical. Um, Doing nothing isn't usually an option. A lot of natural quote unquote beekeepers are like, but I need to be natural and let them decide on themselves, you know, who survival of the fittest, etc. But it just use an organic treatment then. Just don't do nothing. You're you're gonna lose your bees. You're also gonna affect the bees in your local area, your neighbors' bees. Um might travel from bee to bee. So just just be responsible again. And you can use natural treatments. You can um you know, mess around with the drone, the brood patterns. You can change out drone frames. That's a natural chemical free way um, to mess with the brood patterns because like we were saying earlier, the mites like to lay in those drone drone brood um, cells. So there's there's a lot you can do. Look into this, find out what's right for you. Use a combination of treatments. That's fine. Um, just, just do something. Uh, so here's a couple of things. Nosema, this is something you might see. It looks actually like, do I have, let me see. Yeah, I just want to see what I have pictures of. Okay, so here, this is the Varroa mite picture. We have Nosema on a hive at the bottom here. This is um, a really, really bad case if your hive is at this place. Uh, there's, there's no return or you probably weren't there for months. You will see a little bit of droppings on a hive normally, especially with cleansing flights. That's okay. But if they're basically getting like a stomach flu and have diarrhea like all over, this is an issue. And you can get you know, a couple little medications to put in their sugar water if you start to suspect this. Um, but again, that hygiene, that hive placement in the beginning of season, dry bees, um, healthy bees, a, a polyfloral diet, all of those are so important um, to keeping them healthy. Prevention is a big part of this. Sometimes when they're at these phases, it's it's too late. So um, that's just something to consider. Uh, mice and predators, we talked about those entrance reducers, um, keeping your hives above 18 inches or so. You don't want like skunks and stuff like getting into them, trying to trying to eat your bees at the entrance. They they can just stand up and just eat bees right out of the uh, right out of the entrance there. Bears are attracted to the brood and the eggs um, for protein source. So you might want to consider an electric fence if you're in a really rural area. Um, a lot of people think bears are going after the honey like Winnie the Pooh and that's not quite the case. They're going after protein. So um, you might need an electric fence. They have solar battery operated. You know, you can come up with some configurations. Just just know your area. If you see bear every other year or every year, um, it's something you probably do want to consider. Uh, if you're in a more suburban area, a little bit more um, traffic around that keeps kind of wild animals away, you might be all right. You know, just just um, a few different ways to protect against that. Uh, we have a few more here. I'm just going to go into beetles for a minute because beetles are, you know, you're going to see them. Um, but if they get really bad, there are beetle traps. You can use like a natural Swiffer pad on top. Look into these. Um, this is a $2.00 easy uh do i have that on there yeah this is i go more into that with the other class um you just put a little mineral oil or oil in these traps and the, the beetles just fall in and die and it's easy um swiffer pad non-scented you can stick on top of the hive and uh the beetles just get caught in it and you can just remove them and that's fine it doesn't affect the bees american foul brood is um you know, more of a spore issue. If your colony has this, you just like have to burn down the hive. Like if you need an inspector to come and see if you've had this or test the hive, um, this is really bad. Like there's just no no return for this. Um, these are the things you want to look into and just be aware of when you're getting into beekeeping. Uh, foul brood right here. There's a little test you can do by just sticking like a toothpick or something into this this brood actually. Um, and see if it's like a rope that's called the ropiness test, rope test. Um, if it's kind of like an elasticity to it, you might have a, a foul brood situation. You can smell it um, as well. If you're not sure, get it tested, have somebody come over, check, take pictures. 
Um, again, I go into a lot of this in more depth in my five week course and then another more intense course than that for, for all of these tests, all of these treatments, all of that. For more info on that, just let me know and I'll, I'll get you the info. Um, I, I also have resources again on my, uh, actually I'll show you that one real quick. Um, on the B resource, I really like this website. Where is it? Dun, 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 dun. Be aware, pest management. And this is an Australian site, um, but they really break it down really well. Um, so it's funny because some of the exotic pests to them are like what we see more. But they will tell you tests. They will tell you, um, show you pictures of what things look like, um, history of things, spread, symptom detection, what to do, fact sheets. You know, there, these, there are resources everywhere. So this course I am kind of teaching you right now is really just to get your feet wet, but like then you know now what to look into or what you might be in for if you keep bees. Um, this isn't super common, this like foul brood, but you know, just be aware. Mites are common. Uh, Nosema, it can be common. Um, We've got beetles here. We talk if the beetles get really bad, like beetles and wax moths actually. Oh, I don't have a photo of both. Um, look similar, but like th this is called having your colony slimed. Like if it's gotten that far, you know, this will be, this is bad. You want to remove these frames. Um, you can freeze frames if it's not too bad and kind of put them back in. Um, again, these sites and these, these full-blown resources will tell you what to do with each and every one of these um, issues. Uh, we got chalk brood here, this kind of really chalky looking, dry um, brood. This is an issue. So these are just things you want to really keep keep an eye on. Um, I think that just I, just an overview. There, there's a little more. Um, but yeah, just, just to kind of know you might be dealing with pests when you uh, keep bees. Um, so now we're just looking at overwintering bees. So we've dealt with our pests. We may be done our mite treatments, et cetera, treatments, uh, tracheal mites. Tracheal mites you'll hear about. They're not crazy common right now. But like if you're treating for varroa mites, you're treating for tracheal mites. You can use grease patties and stuff like that to prevent. Um, but yeah, if you're treating for varroa, usually you're treating for tracheal mites. Um, all right, so you're doing your treatments, you're good. Uh, you might want to combine weak colonies in the fall if you're like, oh, I don't know if this one's going to make it. This one doesn't have a good population. They don't have enough stores. Just combine them. Just better to give them the best shot. You know, you might lose a queen that way, but whatever. You're gonna, they're going to keep the better queen. If you combine colonies, they will decide who is the best um, queen, and they will, they will keep her and kill the other one. Uh, so you might want to combine them over the winter. Um, do not be taking, like you said, too much honey. You know, when in doubt, leave 100 pounds if you can, uh, if you're not sure, or just talk to someone at a club, email me, send me pictures, whatever you need to do. They do even have um, scales for hives to see how much, you know, they're bringing in overflow season, week to week. You know, that's, that's more advanced, but if you, if you really want to get all into it, feel free to get a scale. <laughs> Um, all right, so the drones get kicked out of the hive in the fall. We talked about that. The male bees get kicked out. So your populations will start to diminish um, as you go into the winter. So like that's why our hives, you know, hive sizes get smaller. We take off the honey supers. Um, we reduce the hives back down. Um, you know, the drones are kicked out. It's kind of sad. You don't see them. You see them all dead in front. They're trying to get back in and the worker bees don't let them back in. Um, they, you know, she has to lay again. Drone, um, drone brood in the spring for the for the drones to come back. Uh, let's see, we talked about being aware of food, supplemental syrups if you need, um, but don't like feed syrup all year. Like, you know, they, some people do this and they take all the honey and then they just keep feeding them sugar. They need a polyfloral diet to be healthy. Just like when they say in nutrition, you know, upkeep for humans, like eat the rainbow, you want to eat, you know, carrots and red peppers and green lettuce, like same for bees. Like you want them to have wildflower and, and poly nutrition, um, polyfloral uh, sources of food coming in. If you just ate like literally sugar or pasta every day, like you would be pretty sick, right? So think about that for the bees. It's a backup. It's not like supposed to be their main source. Um, some bee beekeepers will do that. They will feed all sugar syrup, take all of the honey for themselves, and that's awful. And again, you're not doing yourself a, a service in the end. You're going to lose those bees. They're not going to be healthy. Um, yeah, they're just not going to make it that well. So the more you can do for them, the more they're going to do for you. Uh, temperature control. So this is huge in the winter. Um, the bees, you might want to insulate. You might not. Depends also where your bees are from originally. Or have you had them several years where you're getting them used to the cold? Have you bought local 
New York uh, Northeast bees. Um, these are things to consider. What bee species have you had? Um, if you want to insulate or not. But inside, it's a little bit different winter to summer. So in the winter, the bees are not like trying to heat up the entire hive. They will just be heating up the cluster um, of the bees uh, around the queen, and they're just shivering. They're creating heat um, just to keep her warm. There's more to that, again, in that, in that further class. But um, And then in the summer, they are basically they are kind of trying to like air condition the hive with, with water droplets that they're bringing in again why you need that water source so it's a little bit different um, summer to winter uh, but when you're insulating what you need to keep in mind is that if you're if you're insulating hardcore uh, and you don't have a top entrance or something to ventilate then that's when we talked about the droplets like a greenhouse will go up to the roof uh, then rain back down on the bees um, and then they'll get wet and they will freeze and they will die and you'll open your hive whenever you kind of have a minute to open it and you'll see them dead and it's too late. So just it's better for them to be a little bit cold than them to be wet. So um, make sure that there's ventilation somehow in, in your top boxes. Um, and again, email me, text, we can talk about it. Um, there's all different ways to do it and uh, you can get creative with it, watch videos, research it, but that's huge is the ventilation. Um, let's see. So you're going to remove your honey supers. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Any extra space? Yeah. So you don't want to have too big of a space. Uh, you want it to be relative to your bee population so that you don't have this huge space that the bees are either like trying to heat up a little bit. But what happens also is like they're moving from space to space, eating up their honey stores. So if they have to go really far, you don't want like six, you know, supers of honey. Um, and then they're like trying to basically disassemble on warmer days and then re reassemble and, and kind of condense um, on cooler days to to get around a new food source and then keep warm. So you want to kind of just keep these ratios in mind of, of how big you want the space to be. Ratchet straps you want to have, like we talked about for the winds, um, weights on them can be good. If you have really windy areas, just keep all this in mind, wind block. Um, so then we talked about later this bottom line here. Uh, candy boards, sugar patties, have those recipes. If you need, you can buy them. I can tell you where if you don't want to make them. Uh, yeah, so just keep that in mind when you are overwintering um, the bees. Additional equipment that we kind of didn't talk about today. Again, there's just so much, but we talked about just the basic hive setup, but there's like things for honey extraction and you've got rollers and knives and extraction equipment. You have your smoker, your gloves, your jackets. Um, everyone's asking me now, do I need a veil and a jacket and a pantsuit? And it's what you're comfortable with. Um, I just usually recommend like a jacket and some loose fitting pants and maybe some galoshes, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who go into their hives without anything on. I don't recommend it. You don't know what you're walking into. You don't know if you have a queenless hive that's aggressive. Um, I also don't use a ton of smoke um, in the beginning. Uh, maybe a little, depends on the time of year, but I like to kind of feel out the hive and what they are dealing with at the moment. Are they agitated? Is something going on? If they're agitated, you're going to hear them. You want to like really be in tune with that before just smoking them or spraying them with some sugar water to calm them down. Um, then once you know the issue, then maybe you're like, all right, this, this hive doesn't have a queen. They're really agitated. I got to get in there and see what's going on. All right, I'll grab my smoker. I'll smoke them a little bit, which basically just makes them kind of think there's an emergency. They go fill their tummies with food and they're just distracted a little. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, you, you pick the way you use things, but you, all, you don't know what you're getting into. I've even had it during robin's robbing season where you go back to the um the apiary and there's there's wasps and there's hornets and there's other things back there that like i at least just always try to wear a veil i actually i don't and i should that's that's my issue so i recommend it i had a hornet sting in my face last season and i blew up and had to call an ambulance it must have been something i never had before so just keep that in mind um there are different gloves to get. I like my my little frame grip because I don't have to get in there as much. Um, you can wear all different types of gloves. Uh, just just see what's right for you. Know your allergies. Um, you don't have to get the whole pants suit, but maybe you want to. I like to get overalls because at least if my jacket is over that, I'm protected because I've had bees get in my pants and I've had to have my husband pants me in the yard and be like, I got to get this guy out. If a bee gets in your... Um, what is it called in your uh, in your hood? You know, it can be a little daunting. The best thing to kind of do, I hate to say, is just squish the bee if you can, because you don't want it to like poke your eye or, or whatever. But if you can, I honestly have had it happen. Just I unzip slowly my um my uh, my hood and I just let it go back and then you know I just let the bee try to 
you know, try to fly out or I'll unzip the jacket and just like slowly take it off a little, you know, further away from the hive and just let it be that's stuck. Um, the worst is when it gets stuck in your hair because it gets stuck and it gets very upset. It gets itself more stuck and that's when you usually get a sting in the face or something. So just things to be aware of. Um, I don't recommend like the videos, all these people not wearing stuff. Um, it also really depends. Are you are you dealing with a swarm that's really gentle, like you saw me picking up bees earlier? Um, what is it called? Uh, yeah, it really depends on what you're walking into. So again, the more you know the biology, you know the seasons, you know are they protecting something, are they not? Um, that's what we are looking at. So we talked about the, oh, I don't know if we talked about the perch a little bit. I love this guy too. I am going to back up. You guys are probably getting bored of me at this point. Where is that little picture of the perch I love? Da, da, da. Um, where was he? I just saw him. I'll Google it if not, but meh. I don't know, I saw it somewhere, but I will. Frame perch, frame perch, beekeeping. So this allows you to, um, there we go. Like when you're taking your, um, frames out of the box just to hang it on the side here instead of having to like haphazardly lay them somewhere you know where the bees are getting smushed or whatever so uh yeah the perch is pretty cool and also you, when you're inspecting you want to like take out your frames for the most part and put them back in in the same order um so the perch kind of lets you organize that too so you take a couple out and then you can just move the rest of the frames the little space inside the box when the, when you put them back you put your last two frames in there done boom also a nice way to like get up close a little bit maybe take a picture you know just let them be a little bit without um, maneuvering them you just don't want them like falling over you're dropping them um, you know some of the the gloves can be a little bit clunky so you don't want them to like drop frames and boxes so make it as easy for yourself as possible because then you do have bees flying all over the place and um, doing all that so these are just some companies here um, that sell bee stuff there's more than that um, but they're just a couple uh, that you can get equipment at I sell equipment now I sell man lake equipment um, so they have a really nice product line. I sell, I sell stuff now in Washingtonville where, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have 30 hives, I might not be the place for you. If you're just looking to get something real quick, a treatment or whatever for the weekend, you know, pop up to the store. Great. The new beekeeper I'm, I'm good for. Um, but if you're ordering a ton of stuff in bulk, I can totally help you with that. But, uh, but yeah, you might just want to order directly from, from these places. I want it to be a place where if you're working on your bees that weekend or something and you need something that you don't want shipped you know, you can't wait a week to have, you know, a treatment shipped to you, something shipped to you, this broke, that broke, you can come up to the shop and get it, or I can set you up with um, your beginner equipment. Um, so we are in Washingtonville. Um, we are, let me show you here, because I have some of my, I have a lot of it online. We are close to getting bees and equipment. Um, most of it getting online. So, you know, you can shop through here to see what we have. A lot of it's your basic setups. We have assembled equipment, unassembled equipment tools, uh, a little bit of queen rearing stuff, some gloves. Um, it's all here. Uh, I want to say we have about 90% of it online now. We've been really rushing to accommodate everybody. Um, but you can also make an appointment. I've been meeting with a few people um, just at the shop, like social distance style. Uh, again, if you're listening to this during the quarantine, um, maybe listening to it later. <laughs> but yeah, so I kind of am going through it with some of my students, especially who are like trying to get their stuff for June. And so we're just doing a walkthrough a little bit of what they want to get. Um, but this has a lot of the basic line that you might need, and I'll be getting seasonal items in as well. Um, I don't really carry much of the clothing because it's just, there's just too many options, just small, medium, large, you know, it's, it gets crazy. I have some veils, some quick gloves, stuff like that. But again, I can get stuff for you if you're not in a rush. Um, you know, we're happy to add it to our order every week or so. Just get in touch with us. Um, you can shop here at all, you know, whatever you need. That's just the other stuff. I'm not as in, you know, that's not a big deal. But we try to have our classes and workshops. We do not have them right now because, again, we are in quarantine. So I am in the process of getting everything online that I can. Um, we do paint a hive. We do workshops. We're trying to get our free, you know, once a month mixer going once we're, you know, back up and, and kind of running with regular social aspects of, of stuff where we can meet and talk about every month what we should be doing with our bees. Um, and, and join a club. That's what we're trying to do is just create something local. We don't have many resources. So this is the uh, good neighbor policy we we're talking about earlier. I totally stole this from the Long Island Club. They're a huge club now. They're growing a lot. Um, 
which I believe I, I don't go much anymore because I'm I'm so I'm in the Hudson Valley and I used to go a couple of years back, but I get all their info. I believe they change locations even because they've grown so much in size. Um, but yeah, so here, yes, you know, more than four hives per quarter acre. Um, you know, have a 10 foot boundary line with your neighbors, um, which is really good. You can also just put like a little fence, a hedge, uh, you know, even lattice people say works. And the bees will just go up and out rather than like, you know, around. Your first couple of days getting bees, they will be doing orientation flights to get to know the area. But um, after that, they kind of like, they know where they're going. And you can you can get out there and just if you're to the side of them, 10 feet or so, you're pretty good. Um, but you can kind of make these little natural barriers. Um, you can block them a little bit if you have neighbors that don't really aren't super fond of bees. Um, there's a little joke that if they don't see them, they probably won't even know they're there, but I didn't tell you that. <laughs> uh, let's see, no hive of honeybees will be maintained. Yeah, so supply of water, you got to do the right thing here because then it's not fair to your neighbors if you're not doing the right thing and maintaining your hive, so that's not good. Uh, let's see, yep. inspections. Yeah, you should really be doing your inspections for sure, March to October. That's a good rule. I actually didn't realize I had this exact date, but I hear that a lot in podcasts, and that's kind of my date, Halloween. Like, that kind of ideally have your hives, like, zipped up and ready to, like, overwinter. Um, just also keeping an eye on the weather, but just have everything ready to go. Like, they should be kind of ready for winter at this point. Da -da -da. Yeah, and you also just want to make sure that you might not have some laws in your area. Uh, I was in Suffolk County when I lived in Long Island. We were actually in like a no law zone where some um, uh, counties or townships or something, they might have something on the government websites that say you can keep these, you, you cannot keep bees, or they just do not have a law either way. So you might just want to check into that and make sure before getting bees. Um, you know, we're more rural up here. I do not really see restrictions anywhere. Everybody's got bees up here. Um, but yeah, just something to look into for sure. Uh, yeah, and again, I was in Long Island when I wrote this. So this is the Long Island Beekeepers Club, but we have um, several up here. There's a Cornell Club. There is a, um, what is it called? Um, Cornell, we have what, oh, so, Southern Orange Beekeepers. That's a new one as well. They have a club online, and they meet um, once a month. Um, we're starting our little, like I said, informal club, but like a mixer once a month, just because I have so many new people that I'm meeting, and they just want to be within five miles of their house, and I don't, and I don't blame them. So we're going to be a resource for that, and we're all going to meet each other. We can do some hive um, inspections together. We can visit each other's hives. It's going to be great. But that's brand new. So again, Blooming Bees is that private group for very local beekeepers, um, and then you can also join like the the groups online like just like just to show you and I know I'm going on and on you can you can tune out but I just I do believe this is important beginner beekeeper look at this there's so many there's like thousands of 41,000 members you ask questions you get 40 answers it's great um, again just know like what you're getting into because somebody in Florida might be answering a question about that you've asked and they might not know but they'll usually ask oh look I'm in Pennsylvania I'm here I'm there where are you um, but these are great groups to even just watch like you don't even have to ask a question just watch the questions go by um, especially beginners you're gonna have the same 10 20 questions uh, watch those videos watch YouTube's on 10 mistakes that beekeepers make there are so many um, great resources out there uh, this I added on um, look into, again, polyfloral diet. I'm so big on this. Um, I share some stuff usually around March um, regarding planting and stuff, and I, I just keep trying to continue to spread the word on planting, and I just, you know, there's just a lot of info out there. I also have honey flow charts on my website under resources, um, nectar flow, things like that. There, there's a lot. Look at look at this in your area to see what grows because, again, polyfloral diets, if your friends are asking what they can do, plant, 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 whatever you can because it's just really going to affect the health of the bees. Um, I just do want to look at this for a minute. The resources I found. Where was this? Oh, this is a calendar. We're going to show you that in a minute as well. Dun, dun, dun. Bee nutrition. Um, I believe it was actually... This was it. Actually, I really like this Wikipedia page about North American nectar sources, and they break this down into um, blooms, what time of year, like you know, how much honey. It's it's great. This is a really great resource. This is on my website, the Wikipedia page, North American nectar sources for honey. Uh, what is the other one? This is by Cornell. Please, I, I can't print enough of these. They're, it's a big packet for people. Beekeeping in the Northeast. This is your calendar. This is a great little like 
Bible of uh, the calendar to use. 21 pages here, January, what should we be doing? February, what should we be doing? March. And this is going to like outline a lot of what I just told you, but you know, this will give you a great guide. Um, I highly recommend. This is also my site, Cornell's website. And um, yeah, so I think that's, that's roughly it. I believe I have one more slide. So if you decided now bees are too much for you, honeybees, you know, maybe mason beehives. Um, mason beehives are actually pollinate way more than honeybees, people don't realize. And you can get like cocoons sent to you. Um, you can order them in the mail, get a be mason beehive, make a mason beehive. Um, I have a little bit of research on them and on bat boxes because we sell them at the store. Um, bats are also pollinators. So if you want to help pollinators, like by all means, mason beehives, bat boxes, um, there's a lot you can do. We donate every month to NewYorkBeeWellness.org. They are big on education seminars. They do a lot of surveys for New York that um, you can fill out surveys and they will spit back that data back to you to tell you what's going on, who's losing their bees, who's not. Um, why, you know, like they'll just, they take anonymous information, they'll use like SurveyMonkey or something, and they're, they're really amazing for New York where we don't have a lot of groups doing that. And they will even do like seminars, they'll travel around the state. Um, some of them are free, some of them are donation, it's, it's excellent. So I highly recommend following them as well. We donate every month to them. Um, and I believe that's about it. So if you do have any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, at any time, I have a blog here that I just answer a lot of um, just random questions, um, pollen, I've got honey, I've got just just everything here on this blog, but just feel free to just contact me. You can just email the Jenny B project at gmail.com or you can um, just fill out this form here. That's fine too. These hours are not current right now just because we are in the quarantine. We're just kind of limited on meeting people for appointments, um, but I did want to get this crash course out there because people are asking and um, and I can't meet them so I feel really bad and education is most important to us um, you know if your bees don't make it my bees don't make it they, they, the health of bees affect other bees like look at us right now look at like I said super organism you know if we don't all stay in right now we're all going to be in trouble and that's a, a perfect analogy for bee health bee mites bee diseases um, you know the more we all know and, and shed um, you know, light on all these issues, it's it's going to be good for us. So, you know, I'm hoping to get up, like I said, all of my classes online. Um, you know, if you want to donate, feel free to send a donation to us um, for this. This is, a, this is a free lecture we have today. This is our crash course. We do this usually for different communities, but now we have it online. Um, if you want to donate, send a little Venmo donation. Um, feel free to at the Jenny B Project, you know, or whatever, but it's really not important. We just really want to get the information out there. We do some kids parties when, when things are normal. A um, little bee education there, paint a honey jar really fun. Um, we can set up different groups, Girl Scouts. We want to make lip balms. We want to make crayons. We want to make fun crafts, do-it-yourself stuff. Um, and then just about beekeeping, we do the observation hive. We bring to fairs. We try to do events and everything. Um, now I'm just going to give you the spiel about us. But yeah, so we have the retail shop. We do the farmer's market in Washingtonville, um, which we hope happens this season. We will see. I help run this with a friend, Micah, um, and we are a part of the events committee in Washingtonville. It's a group of women who do amazing things for the town. Um, right now you should check out There's Some Good News um, and the work programs that are going on um, in this town. It's an amazing town. We really band together um, to make things happen, and we're a really great community. So this is our farmer's market um, that I take part in. I also sell my stuff at these locations. Again, that's not really what I'm trying to tell you about right now, but that's um, where to find us. So if you're looking to see us at a fair, ask questions. I try to bring the observation hive when the weather is um, conducive to it, but I don't always, so it depends. Um, but yeah, reach out to us with any questions. I appreciate everybody listening today. Um, I know it's a lot of information to take in, and we will try to have our five-week course up um, within the next couple of weeks. I'm really trying to record all the lectures and get more videos for you guys. Um, I know that this was a big lecture style uh, you know, slideshow. It's not always as fun, but um, yeah. I, well, you know what I wanted to show you? <laughs> One last thing here. So in the resources, I believe I have, so scientific beekeeping, Randy Oliver, I really, you know, like this as a good trusted source. Um, look, apiary laws for New York. These are things you should look into um, to know that it's okay in your area. But so he's got great videos on like installing a package, installing nucleus colonies, um, 
there's there's a lot of resources here again free same thing donation he's got charts here like real research data the right way you know going on um, so it's a good trusted source if you just google stuff or like search his site for questions this is a good trusted source um, to get information I believe he's in California so certain things you know again you have to think about your climate and stuff but you know again scientific beekeeping Randy Oliver um, great source there's Cornell there's a lot so again thank you um, wishing everybody well during this time you know we are trying to get um, everybody you know some information and then uh, you know just reach out if you have any questions thank you all right bye guys